Hello, good afternoon everyone and welcome to this very last panel uh, entitled Next Generation Wind, pa Wind Power. Uh, this is part of the Future Energy Festival organized by the NA Features Lab, uh, which is one of the Imperial College Global Institutes. My name is uh, Rafael Palacios. I am a professor of computational elasticity in the Department of Aeronautics, uh, where I'm also the director of research. And part of my expertise is on wind, uh, wind energy, wind power uh, modeling. Uh, this is a discussion panel. Uh, we have four academics, including myself, all from Imperial, and with different expertise related to wind energy. So I'm joined today by Dr. Starula Contoy, reader in soil uh, dynamics and civil and environmental engineering. Uh, Dr. Oliver Baxton, within experimental fluid mechanics in the Department of Aeronautics, and Dr. Soraya Pimenta, which is a senior lecturer in composite materials in mechanical engineering. I'll introduce them in, in a second. Uh, uh, we very much work on your questions, uh, and you will see that there is a QA and a box on the right-hand side of the screen. Uh, there you can put yourself with your name, or you can do it anonymously. And uh, the session is recorded, I should say that. Uh, so you have put in your name there, it will appear in the YouTube channel on the EFR eventually. This event uh, should last about uh, an hour, uh, at the end of which uh, we will welcome uh, Anna Corey and Tim Green to, to give us the closing remarks for, for the last two days, which I must say I enjoyed very, very much myself. And uh, in this session, what we wanted to look is to look at the open research challenges in the technologies uh, underpinning wind power. Uh, we have left out uh, on purpose integration on the energy network, which is something we've been covering extensively on other, talk, on other talks and on, on other sessions. Uh, and what we wanted to do is to look at the technologies underpinning uh, wind energy. Uh, wind energy systems, uh, and particularly offshore wind energy, uh, pose uh, 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 still a substantial engineering challenge that cuts across disciplines that will have people from all the various departments today here. And the, fo and the focus of the panel today is trying to look at uh, how a wind farm may look in the future, what are the challenges ahead, how we can make them more efficient, how we can achieve the uh, energy goals that we have as a society uh, through, through renewables. Uh, let, me, let me say a few words to start the discussion and before I introduce our panelists. Uh, uh, the first thing I should say is that wind power is, is a success story of, of let's call it engineering, uh, engineering ingenuity. It's, it's, a, it's a technology that has evolved uh, steadily, uh, has grown to, to, a, to an extent that currently provides 25% of the electricity in the UK, which is mind-boggling for anyone looking to this, how it has grown. Uh, um, that splits roughly in half between onshore and offshore uh, wind power. And uh, offshore is the one which is growing very, very quickly uh, over the last few years. Right now, the goal is uh, to move from 10 gigawatts, which are already existing in the UK, to 40 by 2030. That's a very, very big number and a huge ambition. And the uh, objective in the UK is to decarbonize, decarbonize electricity by 2035, as you may know. This poses a, a, a humongous challenge for, for this community. So how this has been possible? Well, part of this is because the price of wind energy has dropped steadily uh, to the point which now is competitive with, with our subsidies. Uh, and, and one might say, well, this is the point in which uh, the problem is solved. It's a mature technology, there is no more to do. Well, as you see today, there is still plenty of challenges. And, and let me just highlight uh, the, the key areas, and I work on, on some of them, uh, and, and my, my colleagues on the panel uh, uh, are going to be discussing some, some of the details. Uh, the, the first uh, challenge on, on, on the wind energy sector is that, of course, uh, it, it, the best, uh, uh, how to put it, wind resource is not uh, homogeneous. It varies, and the locations in which you put the wind turbine, the wind turbines are of better and worse quality. The best places are taken. Okay, so now we need to expand where we put the new wind farms, and we need more and more. And this is moving to to deep waters. We are going to floating farm systems, and those are technologies which are still not mature to the, to the level that it, they can be competitive. Uh, the second is that uh, the one of the drivers on the uh, drop of, uh, uh, of of cost has been the increase in size of rotors. Uh, and that seems to have uh, no limits, but this is always an engineering challenge to, to get the, the larger rotor comes uh, on top of the existing one. Right now, rotors are uh, of the order of 200 meters in diameter and sticking on, 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 a, on a tower, which is about 200 meters. So those things are starting to be huge structures uh, that need to be there for 25 years plus. 
Okay. Uh, the, the third challenge comes uh, associated to the fact that we have uh, more and more wind turbines, and of course we want to cluster them as, as much as we can, but wind turbines perturb the flow and that means perturb each other. So there is always a, a trade off between how close you can put them and what is the dynamic interference between them. And as you put more wind farms, this comes even between uh, wind farms and subs. So that's uh, a, a massive open challenge uh, for the community, how we can optimize the performance. Um, and, and, the, and the last one is, is what we do with all of these uh, uh, composite materials which are, are putting out there on the blades in particular. There is no right now uh, mechanism for recycling. So we need to make the whole life cycle analysis for, for the wind rotors uh, or the wind turbines to be sustainable for the whole uh, package to really work as, 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 as it should be. Uh, all these things, hopefully, we can discuss them through the next hour. So I invite you all to start putting your questions in the chat. And uh, what I would like to do now is uh, introduce uh, the panel. So it's my pleasure first to, to introduce Estabrula Contoe. Uh, Estabrula, you can take over from me. Uh, th thank you, Rafa. Uh, it's been a pleasure to um, be in the panel. Uh, as you said, I'm a reader in soil dynamics at the Department of Civil and Environmental um, Engineering. Um, my background is in computational geomechanics, uh, specializing in uh, soil structure interaction problems under static and dynamic loading. Over, I would say, the last decade or so, um, uh, in the geotechnic section at, uh, in civil engineering, we have collectively developed, developed a, a strong research portfolio in, in offshore wind. It's a relatively new stream. Uh, of research and um, looking at all different types of uh, foundations varying from gravity based and monopiles where lateral loading is a key aspect uh, in shallow waters to jackets where which are governed by cyclic loading. In all cases the approach is that we um, have three main um, lines to approach the problem if you like. We do field testing mostly onshore because that's financially um, um, viable to replicate as closely as possible the conditions encountered in the various offshore foundation types uh, with appropriate monitoring. And in parallel, we do element testing, element soil testing in the lab to understand the fundamental behavior of the soil under the stress paths that is um, uh, induced uh, offshore um, to inform the development of computational models, which closes the cycle if you like, of, of our tools. And then we use these validated models to predict the response of foundations to different geometries, different conditions. Um, so that's in very schematically the field of research we, we are working, tackling basically any type of foundation uh, at the moment that is used um, uh, in offshore wind. Thank you, Mr. Rula. Uh, and we move uh, over to Oliver Buxton. <clears throat> Thanks, Rafa. Uh, I'm a reader in experimental fluid mechanics in the same department as Rafa in the Department of Aeronautics. And uh, my research background really is in turbulent flows and turbulence. Now, this is important from the perspective of wind energy because wind turbines themselves are situated within a turbulent environment, which is the atmospheric boundary layer. And of course, the turbines themselves produce wakes, which themselves are turbulent. And so the interaction of both um, atmospheric turbulence and wake turbulence with wind turbines is really the focus of my research. So at the moment, I have a, a five year fellowship uh, programme of research, which is looking to better understand and model the physics of turbulent wind turbine wakes and how they interact with subsequent machines in a wind farm because actually a wind turbine situated within a turbulent wake may produce as little as 50 to 60% of the power of a turbine in isolation. So as Rafa mentioned, there is an optimum spacing between turbines in which we can generate as much power as possible from a given area whilst the turbines themselves are operating efficiently. Also, if any of you have flown in aeroplanes, you know that turbulence can have a, quite a sort of jolting effect on an aircraft. And the same thing is true of wind turbines. So we're looking at the interaction of turbulence and things like structural fatigue on um, components of the turbine. Finally, um, on a windy day, as you know, um, if you were in a forest, the wind speed would be reduced in comparison to if you were stood outside the forest. And wind farms have a similar effect. It's called the global blockage problem, 
So the very fact that a large farm of wind turbines exists presents an overall blockage to the wind. And so as a result, the configuration of turbines within a farm affects the amount of power that a farm can produce. So all of these things get fed into the routine for optimising farm layouts, which we might be able to talk about later. Thank you very much, Oliver. Uh, Soraya, over to you. Thank you, Rafa. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm uh, Soraya Pimenta. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Mechanical Engineering here at Imperial College. And uh, my research is focused on the mechanics of composite materials, so the type of materials that go into uh, wind turbine blades, as uh, Rafa mentioned um, earlier. And uh, um, so my research is focused on the entire life cycle of um, these materials, so from the design to the manufacturing to the service and then to end of life. So we study uh, how the manufacturing process influences the properties of composites, uh, including, for instance, the formation of defects. We do research in terms of trying to develop better composites that can lead uh, uh, either to light to lighter structures or to structures that can have a longer service life. We develop new types of composites that can uh, help us designing better structures. And uh, we also address that problem of uh, what should we do with, with composite structures uh, at their um, end of life. And uh, hopefully we will be able to uh, explore how these uh, challenges affect uh, uh, the wind uh, in industry. Thank you. As I mentioned before, everyone, please uh, welcome your questions in, in the Q&A monitoring here. Uh, let me start with a question to you, Soraya. Uh, what happens right now with uh, uh, all these material coming out of wind farms? What is the, 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 the state of the art in, in, in recycling or disposing of what's coming out of the, uh, those wind farms? So um, we actually have two different uh, uh, parts of this problem. So um, if we think about the entire, um, an entire wind turbine, actually most of it, it is currently recyclable and recycled. So if we think about what happens to the foundations, to the tower, to all the um, um, electronics. And uh, um, so all of that, it is currently um, recyclable and that makes about 85% of the total weight of, uh, um, of a full wind turbine. The problem really comes when we think about the blades. So um, the blades are, as you mentioned, they are made of composites. So this is a mixture of uh, technical fibers, typically glass, or carbon or even a mixture of um, the two embedded in a polymer and uh, the fact that we have these two constituents combined makes it very difficult to recycle the blades so um, at the moment we don't have yet a lot of the composite blades to recycle so uh, that is a problem that 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 will start building up very soon and uh, um, and uh, uh, really growing in a dramatic way and at the moment we don't really have uh, solutions that are uh, widespread for um, recycling of composites so basically what happens is that they end up uh, in landfilling um, in most of the cases can that change is there a, uh, tell, us, tell us give us a hope is, is there a is there a plan here to <laughs> yes, yes, what yes. Would, so, what would it take to actually not having to dispose these things in a landfill? So the, the field of um, recycling composites is now very active on a research basis. So there is definitely um, hope. Uh, there are processes that we can use in order to separate the fibers in the composite from the matrix and we can recover the fibers which are the most expensive constituent of the composites and and uh, typically the one that takes more resources to actually produce. So there are a couple of companies that have been created uh, in the last uh, 10 years and then we and which are now um, operating on a commercial basis. 
that do exactly that. So they recycle composites. Uh, they reintegrate the constituents of the composites into new composites that we can use in different um, applications. Now, the problem that we still have is that for this, these recycling methods to actually take off and to be able to get a, um, a recycling industry that can take the amounts of uh, composite that we are expecting to get out of blades uh, in the next few decades. And um, we really need a, a, an effort, a combined effort from uh, um, composite manufacturers, end users, recyclers, and also from policy. So there is work that is ongoing. The fundamental research in terms of creating these recycling processes is pretty much there. Uh, it's just about getting all the, infra the, all the infrastructure that you need in order for this to take off and also finding applications for all the recycled composites that we will get afterwards. That is, I think, the main challenge um, for the future. Thank you, Soraya. Uh, I can start running through the questions in the chat and then passing to, to some of you guys. Uh, first question that came online is what is the lifespan of an offshore wind farm and what are the limiting factors? Uh, I, I mean, I, I can answer this myself. This is typically 25 years uh, as of the, the commissioning time. Then uh, this is monitor where the technology keeps up uh, and then it's, it's efficient to keep a farm. This is something that in 25 years need to be reassessed on top of uh, whether the, the wind turbines themselves lose uh, performance. So there is fatigue issues because they, are mo they have moving parts. Uh, so there is always a, a, a light span you put on these things. The, I guess the, the, the key thing to change is that most wind, wind farms right now are less than 25 years old. So for example, the, the issue that Soraya is mentioning, it will start cascading once we start having all these wind farms getting end of life. And then there will be a tsunami of them because we have a tsunami of construction. So we need to have answers to that problem when the time comes. Uh, Stavrula, maybe you can comment as well on what happens when, with the installation, the foundations that happen on wind farms, whether those can be recycled or can it stay? What happens at, at the end of the 25 years? Uh, as you say, we don't we don't know yet because we haven't been into that stage to do the testing and uh, understand uh, the long term capacity. And actually, I think that's one of the um, irrespective of the reuse, which I think it's a very it's a very big issue that we need to start addressing. Even for the current wind farms that we are designing, we need to better understand the long term load transfer mechanism between the foundation and the soil and how that evolves with time. Uh, because we are quite good in predicting the um, um, at installation capacity at the moment, uh, in most cases, unless we have really unusual ground conditions. But when it comes to the long term and uh, uh, the, the performance of the foundation under uh, sustained uh, cyclic loading, then even there becomes uh, more of, um, of an issue. We do have tools, but uh, they still need to be validated um, with the data from the lifespan uh, time of uh, uh, of the performance of foundations. So I think that's going to be one of the emerging areas of research, the reuse of foundations, which we have a better understanding how it happens off onshore, uh, because there we can test better. It's easier to test uh, um, our, our procedures. Um, but uh, for offshore conditions, that's something that is going to become um, a very active uh, area of research. I mean, it's, it's an obvious question. How do you test at uh, 50 meters and the water in the ocean? And do you guys have the, the right equipment for this? Yes, it has happened. It's very new that has happened. So I'm aware at least, well, we were involved in the, um, uh, in Wikinter field testing um, with automated uh, schemes um, uh, happening under underwater um, and with, but it, the cost is enormous. So at the moment, um, it's very, very rare. Uh, I think Wikinter was one of the first of the Drolla um, field testing uh, uh, attempts. Um, I think there are others taking place, but the problem also is that the wind farm developers keep the, those data um, to themselves and understandably to have the commercial advantage, because if you have spent uh, over 10 million euros to do field testing, you don't want necessarily to be sharing those data with other wind developers. I, I would love if that wasn't the approach at the moment, but 
and we were able to all share data and get understanding, but usually this type of testing is highly confidential and um, at least the, the results of the, of the testing. Thank you. Oliver, I'm going to pass this question to you. Uh, what are the possibilities of using uh, wind turbines at very low speeds, of the other three to five meters a second? Are they prohibitively expensive? Uh, what are the developments that allow us to get energy at those, those low speeds? So um, the sorts of wind turbines that we're thinking of, these very large uh, offshore wind turbines, are horizontal axis wind turbines. And horizontal axis wind turbines uh, simply aren't particularly efficient at low wind speeds. So uh, most of the turbines installed offshore have what's called a cut in wind speed of around four meters per second, which means that if the wind is below four meters per second, they simply don't, they feather the blades out. So they simply don't rotate because it's not worth their while accumulating, as we mentioned, fatigue damage and all of this for such low efficiency power production. However, um, in the last few years, there's been a bit of a resurgence in research on vertical axis wind turbines. So you may have seen these, for example, on um, motorway road signs or maybe even in buildings and things like this, because uh, a vertical axis wind turbine, uh, we can pair them up together so that they're counter rotating. The idea being that by counter rotating, they can effectively duct the air in the gap between the two turbines thereby effectively enhancing lower wind speeds. And so for low wind speed applications, vertical axis wind turbines uh, present a much more attractive proposition. They, they're also advantageous in the fact that because we can use pairs of turbines to work together, we don't have this problem that we have with the large horizontal axis wind turbines where wake interaction between turbines reduces efficiency. So as a result, the energy density in terms of energy we can generate per square kilometer can actually be enhanced. Thank you. Um, I mean, this is a question that applies to all of us. I'm going to run through every single one of you. So how big, this is the obvious, how big can these machines get? And each of one will have a perspective because, of course, that implies a constraint somewhere on the system. And this is a very, very inter interlinked problem. Uh, Soraya, how big do you think this thing can get? What is the manufacturing limits here? So, um, as you mentioned, uh, now we have uh, blades which are uh, 200 meters, um, and that is with uh, um, uh, using composite materials, typically with carbon fibers. So, uh, you need a material that is very stiff and very strong to, to withstand the, the the large loads that are generated with such long uh, um, with such long blades. Now, uh, these turbines, they are, they are made with materials which are, uh, at the moment, commercially available and which are um, established. Um, the field of research in terms of developing new composite materials that are better than the ones that we currently have, that is uh, also an extremely active field. So, um, I think that, that that it's very difficult to predict what uh, the largest blades uh, are going to be, just because uh, you have uh, um, materials that are constantly being um, optimized. So the materials that we have currently um, are not the ones that we're probably going to be using to design blades in, uh, let's say, 20 years time. So um, from a materials and from a structural point of view, I think it, it, uh, uh, it is likely to keep on to, be, uh, to keep on growing at least until we, we, we explore this, uh, these possibilities. Oh, that's good. So one constraint less. OK, let's move to Esther Rula. Uh, do we have a constraint on the foundations? Um, it, it depends on the foundation type, um, obviously. Um, so, for example, monopiles, which have they have gained momentum, and it's probably the, no, it is not properly. It is the most common type of foundation at the moment. They are restrained to shallow depth. So we are, uh, when I say shallow, up to 30, 35 meters, simply because then they become so big that uh, that you get issues of installation. You cannot get the hammer big enough, basically, to put in simple words, to, <laughs> uh, to to install them. Yeah. So then we have to go for deeper um, deeper depth, and you are looking to different solutions. 
um, intermediate depths up above 30, 30 meters, 35 meters, you will be looking at jacket uh, foundations where the oil industry has shown that uh, you can go to very large depths, but then becomes a cost benefit issue of whether by using multiple piles for a wind turbine it makes sense and whether it's financially viable and that's where the um, the, uh, the floating uh, turbines uh, um, wind, uh, floating foundation types come into play uh, mm. and it's probably the future for, for, for these things uh, at the moment um, they are uh, at the early stages they are two uh, pilot projects, um, one in Scotland that I believe just got into per operation uh, and one in uh, in Portugal. Uh, but uh, as it was the case with the more um, traditional types of uh, foundations, I mean, as it was the case for fixed bottom foundations, they will need to go through cycles of adaptation uh, to, to, uh, to accommodate the different dynamic uh, loading scenarios. Uh, these uh, novel uh, types and to understand how much weight they, they can carry. Oliver, is there an aerodynamic limit? Because so far we have none. Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm going to be the party pooper. So um, naively we can say that as turbines become larger, they become more efficient. Uh, indeed, aircraft wings, uh, the efficiency of the wing is determined by something called the aspect ratio, which is essentially the ratio of how long it is to how wide it is. So the larger the aspect ratio, the more efficient the aerodynamic device. However, we come into some constraints when we consider the realities of wind turbines. So at the moment, hub heights of turbines are around 200 metres or so. And so we're just starting to uh, leave what I would consider to be the well modelled portion of the atmospheric boundary layer. So, for example, the nature of the turbulence 200 metres above the ground is very different from the nature of the turbulence 100 metres above the ground, which is in um, a region of the atmospheric boundary layer, which we've developed a great deal of understanding of over the years. Additionally, wind speeds become higher as we move further above the ground as well. And so, of course, therefore, loading becomes larger and also more inhomogeneous in terms of the different aerodynamic loading at the top versus the bottom of the um, actuator disc. On top of that, of course, the, the larger the blades become, the, the more serious the issue becomes of aeroelasticity, which is, of course, your area of expertise, Rafa. And so these turbines become more and more flexible and the aerodynamic prediction becomes harder and harder. Additionally, when the turbines become very large, we have to consider the fact that they're situated on the earth, which is in a rotating frame of reference. And so we have to start to consider things like Coriolis effect especially when we consider clusters of wind turbines and interacting between adjacent farms. But probably the ultimate limit is going to be on the tip speed, because essentially wind turbines rotate at a constant speed, which is going to be given by the um, AC frequency of the electricity mains in a particular country. And so essentially the tip speed becomes rotational speed times by blade length. And so sooner rather than later, if the blades become too large, the speed at the tips can start to become very large indeed and can lead to very unpleasant aerodynamic effects due to high angles of attack such as stall for example. The ultimate limit being of course when we reach compressibility. So helicopter blades obviously are designed such that the tip mark number never exceeds one. Okay we have a limit but there is there is room for growth. Like if, this is something that everyone in the, in the wind energy community has been uh, wondering for, for a long time, how big we can make these things. And there is always a new solution that keeps pushing the technology. We will find this limit. We just haven't found it yet. Uh, I don't know if anyone can, can give my, the feeling on this one. Is there any future for onshore wind in the UK? Can anyone comment? I can comment if it's so, a uh, Oliver. I, I can start off that from an aerodynamic perspective, offshore is a much more pleasant environment. We have a, a much more uniform um, direction of the winds. We have a much more predictable nature of the atmospheric turbulence. We're not going to be affected by things like terrain. So from an aerodynamic perspective, offshore wind is certainly more favourable. But there are, of course, other issues such as power transmission as well, which I won't get into now. Um, which would suggest that onshore is, is is certainly more attractive in certain areas, but I would say from an aerodynamic perspective, offshore is more attractive. 
Uh, what about the ambition for, for the UK? So there's a question that says the UK has very ambitious offshore wind targets. Do you think they will be met? And what key challenges and solutions do you see to achieve them? Uh, can I start? Stavrila, you want to pick on this one? Um, yeah, so I follow up also on the on the onshore. I think from the geotechnical perspective, it's easier definitely the onshore. But um, uh, looking a bit from my home home country experience from Greece, they 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 very much see the position from the public, uh, mm -hmm. which to me comes to surprise. But uh, local communities they don't like. They always want it somewhere else, um, and that is a big problem for um, the onshore uh, onshore wind. Where offshore, obviously, especially when you go to large distances from from the shore, you you don't you don't have this type of issues. Um, the, the targets, I, I would think so. I mean, the the boom in in at the moment in the. I mean, I haven't to be full disclaimer. I haven't looked at details. So I'm saying that as a more as a intuition rather than trying to do any specific research whether the UK will meet the targets. Uh, but the current uh, trend and the current um, momentum uh, in the wind energy is, is tremendous. Uh, I think the limiting factor there is whether we'll have enough. Uh, manpower uh, in terms of, uh, of designing and uh, manufacturing uh, rather than anything else. Whether we have the ex enough expertise um, among um, our our graduates uh, to um, actually be able to deliver this, because other than that, I don't see why there is a strong drive there is um, uh, in the UK for materializing and has done extremely well. Uh, over the recent years in actually um, developing uh, offshore wind. Uh, personally, I would agree with that. I think it's very ambitious, uh, but uh, the the evidence is, is there that we've been meeting these goals regularly as, as, as a country, as a, as a whole. Right now, the, the numbers is that uh, the target is 40 gigawatts in, in 2030, but 20 of them are already either built or commissioned. So we are talking about doubling is a lot. But there is there is an inertia that really I, I'm I'm very optimistic myself. Whether if something stays on the way, we'll see. Uh, this is a bit outside of our topic uh, or expertise. But uh, uh, has anyone given any thought about the environmental impact? So local wildlife, uh, plants. It, it, this is a, always a. a an open issue. I know there's activities going on there. I've been exposed to some. It's not my expertise, so I cannot really comment uh, as an expert. I don't know whether any of you can say it's a, it's a, it's a yeah. So OK, I'm, I'm afraid we won't be able to answer this. There, there are always implications, and, and I, I'm very much aware there has been a study, and it's not only environmental impact. I know of a study of uh, the uh, uh, Minister of Defense in the UK that was looking at the impact that wind farms in the ocean have on radars, which are monitoring and scanning over the sky. Uh, there are un unintended consequences to, to very large development like this and, and, and many other ones. So definitely this is something which I know is being considered. Yes, that we don't have the expertise here to really comment on, on the aspect. Maybe, Rafa, just to add that, for example, for the installation uh, of uh, foundations, uh, the, the people are, I mean, there and there are certain limits. They, they, they are, there is monitoring to ensure mm -hmm. that the marine mammals are not affected by the vibrations caused by pile installation, for, for example. And there are um, new emerging techniques to mitigate uh, the noise uh, from the installation. Uh, for example, bubble curtains and other uh, novel technologies are um, are used to try to minimize the impact on, on marine mammals. Um, Oli, can you comment on, on this question? Uh, what do we do at the, uh, what technologies in wind uh, turbine and farm level control strategies can potentially optimize production efficiency? Yeah, so so this is a, an excellent question, uh, which I'm studying myself. So it's a it's a pet area of interest. But uh, as I say, with the horizontal axis wind turbines, um, they produce turbulent wakes, and um, within these wakes, the flow is both highly turbulent and also contains less energy than essentially the the free wind that hasn't been disturbed by the upstream turbines. And so it's it's very unattractive to place a turbine within the wake of an upstream machine. But of course, um, this isn't possible because we're constrained by the land area that we have access to. As you mentioned, the best sites are already taken. And so depending on what the nature of the geotechnics are nearby, we not might not be able to build in the 
in an unconstrained fashion. And so we somehow have to live with the fact that wind turbines are going to be operating within the wake of an upstream machine at certain points in their lifespan. And so we need to adopt um, strategies to try and mitigate this. And so the first thing to do, of course, is to optimise the layout of the wind farm. And optimising the layout of the wind farm will mean we'll need meteorological data to get um, good statistics about prevailing wind direction, turbulence intensity, these kinds of things, such that we can, um, by using high fidelity, well, by initially using low fidelity models of the turbulent wakes, and some sort of wind farm optimization tool in which we have a, a merit function which rewards total power produced and penalizes things like expected downtime due to maintenance, we can come up with some sort of optimal layout for our farm and we can then use higher fidelity models to sort of do the fine tuning about that layout. But as far as operation is concerned, we also need to come up with operational control strategies. So for example, one thing we can do is we can yaw um, the turbines in the first row in order to try and steer the wakes away from the more centrally located turbines. This is something which is known as wake steering and recent technological advances have started to make this possible. This includes both um, higher fidelity models of the wakes because we need to know, we need to have a some sort of model for if I actuate the turbine, what is the um, essentially dynamic response of the wake in response to that actuation. So obviously advances in wake modeling allow that to happen. But also technology such as LIDAR, which is effectively a light based radar, which we can put on turbines to scan the incoming flow. So we can try and yaw the turbines in response to changing um, atmospheric conditions. On the blades themselves, we can also come up with control strategies such as affecting the pitch angles of the blades in order to try and make, for example, one turbine less greedy for the benefit of the farm as a whole. So essentially we're trying to maximise the sort of global output of power and also to improve aerodynamic inefficiency where we might have things like stall or buffet or things like this. Thank you, Ole. Um, okay, I can take this, this one question. Does rotation speed have to be locked to the mains frequency or could they generate a DC using Burton's transform to local mains frequency? Uh, that might be back to the comment you had before, Oliver. Uh, I, I don't think that the rotation of the rotors is locked to the uh, to the mains, uh, or not directly. They don't. They don't spin at, at the same frequency. They can't <laughs> effectively. They spin at 50 hertz. Uh, there, there are these generators in the process, of course, of the, the converters which are, make that transition. The rotation of the wind blades, and this is something I, I was explaining my five-year-old as we were traveling in Spain this year. You know how big is a wind a wind farm or a wind turbine by just seeing how how fast it, it spins. Okay, the larger they get, the, the slower they go. And the, and, the, and the reason there is, is the tip speed, which is becomes the, the, the speed at the very tip of the wind. That's the limit at the design now. And this is what Oliver was referring before. We want to keep that under decent aerodynamic conditions. And that puts a, a speed around which each of the different wind turbines will, will need to operate as, 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 a, as a maximum, depending on the, the radius. A challenge there is when you have very, very large wind turbines, they will need to move very slowly because this arm becomes huge. And that poses challenges on, on how you actually get energy on, on such a slow system. There are also uh, some, some issues associated there. So I, I assume there might be a limit there in terms of what generators are able to take. Uh, that's for you, Stavrola. What is the future of floating foundation for uh, wind turbines? I think they're very promising and uh, it seems at the moment that the only viable solution for going to deeper waters, um, they need to be proof tested and uh, at the moment from what I understand without being an expert in in, uh, in floating uh, foundations, um, our, um, uh, this is underway with uh, what I was saying earlier, the two um, uh, pilot, I would, I would call them, given that they are so small, they are small now in the same, they are 50 megabytes, I think, and 20 megabytes, 50, I think, megabyte, megabytes is uh, the uh, Scottish one, and half of that, I think, is a Portuguese one, but the Portuguese one goes to deeper waters, I think, goes to 100 meters. Mm -hmm. um, so they will need to, um, to see how this is, becomes commercially viable as well. Uh, that they manage to prove that they can um, um, uh, th they bring the benefits um, and they can scale scale up uh, from being now at this small scale to a, a proper um, full um, uh, wind farm capacity as we know it in most common uh, setups. 
Um, so I, I would say just we have to watch the space and uh, we will have to go through adaptation, as I was saying, because in the same way that um, jackets and uh, monopiles keep evolving to adapt uh, to our better understanding of um, the loading conditions, in the same way the different solutions, because there's not just one solution of a floating foundation, there are different ones that have been uh, proposed. Um, again, often um, um, borrowing uh, setups from the oil industry, borrowing some of the ideas, um, they, they will have um, to see how they how viable they prove commercially as well. So, so currently, just to follow on, on this, currently we do have deep water installations, right? I think for oil and gas exploration, we have systems that really go deep in the ocean and mineral extraction. So we have uh, the technology to, to attach uh, structures, large structures to, to, to the bottom of the ocean, correct? Correct, but are there different loading uh, conditions and loading uh, loading paths than the ones that uh, the wind uh, loading imposes? Uh, there are very different structures, obviously, the the oil rigs to, to the ones that we're using to, for wind turbines. And then it's also the scalability in terms of like, we don't just need, it's a sheer size of how many you need and whether this type of foundation can be scalable to, to multiples to populate a wind farm. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I'm sure I, I'm 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 optimistic about that. I think this is going to be one of the future, uh, uh, the future monopile. Let's call it. It's it can only be better, right? Because you're using now the the, the water as a, as a floating device. You don't need to hold all the all the forces, right? So there is a, a, an advantage of of having a floating system. And now is the issue of how you deal with the very well deep. <laughs> Connector because you at the end yeah. need to hold it. I mean, one thing that I guess is, is, is to be clear to everyone is that you just don't put a boat there and you let the wind turbine float around. They will steer because they have huge forces coming around there. So you need to hold them like a kite fundamentally. You need a sort of mooring system that goes and attach it somewhere, otherwise, they will just go. There no yeah, way. there are these, there are the tension like platform solutions, there are even mm. semi submersible solutions that uh, people have proposed. Um, yeah, so I think there's a lot of um, kind of technology development in that area to optimize to see what's more suited for the loading conditions that we are having uh, uh, for, for wind turbines. Uh, Oliver, we got another aerodynamics question here. Uh, some all the propeller driven aircraft had two contra rotating propellers. Presumably, this was more effective. Uh, would this work on a turbine to increase output, uh, somehow harness the turbulence of the blade? Uh, so, yes, I mean, we can increase performance of a single uh, tower by putting two counter rotating uh, turbines on it, but we would do so with a horrible efficiency. We would essentially um, take two wind turbines and make both of them extremely inefficient because essentially the wake of the first turbine is directly incident on the second um, propeller. So we'd be much better off placing two turbines a larger distance apart than putting them together. However, counter rotating impellers have been suggested for floating wind farms simply because the process of getting a wind farm out into the middle of the ocean is so much more difficult than it is in mounting a wind turbine close to shore or even onshore. And so this has been proposed as a way to improve energy density from floating farms. And actually, I'd like to make one last point about floating farms, which I think is very interesting from an aerodynamic perspective. Um, I've previously talked about how the spacing between wind turbines can be optimised. And of course, this spacing depends on uh, atmospheric conditions. And so one of the advantages, of course, of a floating wind farm is that that spacing can be dynamically changed in response to changing wind direction or other atmospheric conditions. So it actually makes for a very interesting um, aerodynamic and control problem when designing an offshore farm. I'm going through the list and they are mostly aerodynamics of farms. So Oliver, what do you think is the, the greatest challenge that experiments and simulations face regarding the fluid mechanics side? And how can we overcome this? Uh, so so another, an, another good question. So. Essentially, as turbines become larger and larger and larger, um, scaling becomes more and more of an issue. So obviously, um, a lot of wake models are based on empiricism and empiricism becomes outdated as soon as the 
uh, wind turbines start to get very, very large. And so the scaling from what we can produce in wind tunnels up to real life is increasingly difficult. And the same thing is true of simulations. So there's no such thing as a simulation that can resolve all of the scales which are relevant to wind energy. So these range from the millimetre scale, where we're looking at individual turbulent fluctuations on in the boundary layer on the particular blades, all the way up to tens of kilometres for the weather, which is going to obviously affect the nature of the atmospheric flow in a particular wind turbine site. And so essentially this comes down to modelling. And this is true for both experiments and simulations. We need to be able to produce experiments in the wind tunnel, which whilst they don't meet the same scaling parameters that we have in the real world, so things like Reynolds number or um, things like Rayleigh number when we're considering uh, buoyancy effects, we have to try and come up with sophisticated experiments to try and reproduce that scaling as best we can. And then the same thing is true for um, simulations when it comes to doing for example, high fidelity simulations where we resolve atmospheric turbulence, we resort to modelling the wind turbines themselves through an actuator disc or an actuator line. And so improving this modelling will obviously improve the sophistication of these simulations. Um, I follow on to this, and, and uh, so we tend to think of what we need to model for the aerodynamics, but I am also interested in uh, the scale on which things are built, how you model the manufacturing processes and as we were saying before, the life cycle analysis. Oria, can you comment on that? It's, it's, it's modelable? Uh, it's, it definitely is, but there are big challenges. So, um, modeling the, the failure of composites is uh, something that is getting now very mature. Uh, you have problems of uh, uh, coupling the elastic behavior with the um, aerodynamics behavior and, and you uh, are much better placed to talk about that than I am. Uh, there are also challenges in terms of modeling and uh, designing uh, blades for fatigue. Uh, also in terms of, of, of trying to make that um, efficient. Um, Modeling the manufacturing process is becoming more and more important as we try to uh, take the manufacturing processes that we have to the limit, both in terms of the scale of the components that we are trying to manufacture and uh, also in terms of the um, of the throughput that that's, that these manufacturing process uh, processes need to um, have now. So that becomes a really interesting problem that uh, combines not only mechanical engineering, but also, for instance, chemical engineering that that, that uh, you need to uh, um, you need to use in order to understand how well cooked that matrix that holds the fibers together uh, is, so that the blade doesn't simply fall uh, uh, apart. How you take into account uh, defects and variability. Um, and when we go then to the end of life, uh, at the moment, most of the work that has been done on uh, um, recycling has been pretty much empirical. Um, there are questions about uh, uh, whether we can improve the, the, um, the recycling process um, as well. And also at the end, uh, how we can design new structures with the recycled composites that we can in the future make out of the blades. So uh, uh, getting design methods to uh, make new structures out of recycled composites, which are intrinsically different from the virgin composites that go uh, into blades, is something that is extremely important in order to create a market for these recycled composites that will hopefully uh, fuel the entire uh, recycling it, it, industry to to get uh, effectively settled. OK, um, can, can I get into another aerodynamics question, Oliver? Uh, can you fit windlets as you do on aircraft wings on the end of lanes to improve efficiency? Uh, yes, is the short answer to this question. So um, winglets essentially give you um, a, an improved aerodynamic efficiency that you would otherwise expect to get from a slightly longer wing, but with a slightly smaller penalty on bending moment at the centre. And so essentially you get the benefits of a longer wing with 
a structure that can be built with less material or to a lower degree of specification. And they haven't currently been installed on wind turbines, but I know from my industrial partners at Vestas that this is something that they're looking at mm -hmm. um, as to whether um, the winglets themselves are an improvement on simply just making the blades longer. But there's a second aspect to winglets, which I think are important. And as I keep mentioning, centrally located turbines are um, situated within the wakes of the upstream wind turbines. And the largest structures present in wind turbine wakes are the helicoidal vortex shed by the tip of the rotating blades. And so actually specifically targeting these blade tip vortices can be an efficient way to improve overall farm efficiency by virtue of the fact that we're improving the inflow condition to downstream turbines. So even if the winglets themselves don't necessarily improve efficiency of the upstream turbines enormously, they could still be beneficial from the perspective of global farm efficiency. Uh, another classical add-on, and this is typically in, in ONSO, just to add to this, is uh, look at uh, aerodynamic correction, aerodynamic uh, attachments to reduce noise. This is typically done in ONSO. So, uh, and there's been lots of wind, tur wind turbines with serrated uh, um, uh, trailing edge at the end of the of the of the of the blade, and this has been proved to to reduce noise. So there are modifications that are for purposes which may be other than actually improving the performance of the wind turbine on the aerodynamic side. Is for for other other things which actually are involved as, as side effects. Uh, okay, I will run this to everyone. Uh, what's the wackiest, most out of their idea you have heard about the future of wind? like flying wind farms made from materials which store the energy in them and don't work to discharge energy. If you have heard of anything, who wants to jump on this one? Nah. Well, I, I'll start by saying I, th I think floating farms are fairly wacky. Um, <laughs> as, as I say, we, we, we've spent um, decades trying to understand the turbulent wake produced by a wind turbine in a fixed position. Now, of course, we have a wind turbine which is oscillating according to the waves. And so we've got um, a coupling between what's going on in the water phase and what's going on in the air phase. And so the modelling these particular wakes is a is a real head scratcher. So, you know, that'll keep us busy for the next few years, that's for sure. Yeah. I personally like the, the floating, uh, not the floating, sorry, the, the airborne uh, wind turbines that have, some people have been promo proposing. You basically take a wind turbine on top of a kite and you stick it out there. And it, it looks lovely. I'm a narrow, a narrow guy from the aeronautics department that combines my, my two passions. You know, you fly and then you get an idiot of it. That, that would be just perfect. Uh, I don't think it does make sense though. At the scale, we need to do things. But it's really, really lovely. Uh, let me see if we have anything. And I don't know if you, sorry, Stavrula, any anything you came across that you loved? <laughs> it is okay. Uh, I think we have run through everything here. Uh, so it's almost four o'clock. So if uh, you want, this is probably a good time to finish this. So I would like to thank my my panel today. I thought it was a very interesting discussion. Thank you very much for your time, Soraya, Oliver, and Stavrula. And uh, I think it's time to move to the final bit. If we have our uh, co-directors in place, I think I see them online. So, uh, well, I, all I need to say is that this was the last session of the Future Energy Festival. And so I will now hand over to Professor Tim Green and Anna Corey to some final uh, remarks. Thank you, Rafa. Thank you to um, your three fellow panelists. I thought that was a an excellent session and, and a really stimulating debate. Um, by some strange coincidence, my teaching tomorrow is going to cover wind power. And so now I'll be able to drop in some nice new insights about the future of wind power from, from this session. So, so it's a very personal thank you for me as well. Um, as you say, Rafa, this discussion rounds up the uh, 2021 Future Energy Festival. I want to say a big thank you to everyone watching us uh, from where, wherever you are. Um, we're absolutely delighted that so many of you came along and engage with the topics being discussed over the last two days and, and asking some excellent questions and, and keeping our panelists on their toes also. Um, we hope whether it's your uh, first time participating or whether you're uh, someone who's joined us many times that you, you enjoyed this event and found it informative. It is 
for us a new a new format for this festival and and um, we're welcome to be back on, on any of that um, a special thank you to all of the panelists and speakers over the last two days for giving up very valuable time in preparing and, the, and then delivering uh, the event and uh, warm thanks from me to the energy futures lab team who put the festival together in terms of composing panels and finding speakers and, and, and running the quite complex event over these two days. So thank you very much to, to everyone I just mentioned and I'll now pass over to Anna for her closing remarks. Uh, thank you Tim and thank you everybody. Um, we do hope that the past two days have also given you a taste of uh, the work that we do at Imperial College London and uh, the many aspects of energy research that we are involved in. Um, if you would like to find out more about uh, our work, please visit our website uh, where you can find our briefing papers that we're discussing the last uh, couple of days, as well as details of our upcoming events. You will also uh, be able to find the links to our uh, MSc in Sustainable Energy Futures, which is a unique uh, postgraduate program that covers many of the topics you heard uh, 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 discussions about over the course of the festival. Um, uh, the other thing that is uh, quite exciting for us is that next week uh, we will be launching our new report on the risks uh, of digitalization. So we hope uh, you will have the opportunity to join us uh, if possible and, and hear more about that. And uh, before I leave you, I would like to say a very special word of thanks to my wonderful co-director, Professor uh, Tim Green, who, who is sadly leaving us uh, uh, for uh, the Energy Futures Lab at the end of this year. Uh, he has been uh, instrumental in guiding the direction of the Institute in the last uh, eight years. Uh, he has uh, brought many successes to us and uh, we had the opportunity to celebrate a wonderful lecture uh, yesterday uh, as part of this uh, festival. So I would encourage anybody who might have missed it to uh, look uh, that up and, uh, and follow us on YouTube in the coming days. And uh, with that I would like to bring the 2021 Future Energy Festival to a close and thank you very much once again for joining us and hope to see you soon again uh, online but also in person. Uh, thank you again. <coughs>